Hello! In this series of videos, I'd like to talk about regular languages, and just like how there's a whole bunch of different equivalent Turing complete things, and so they're all equivalent to each other in terms of computation power, uh, there's a whole bunch of different equivalent things that are less powerful than Turing complete things uh, that are all, all characterize the regular languages, that are all equivalent to each other, and it's not obvious at all that they're equivalent to each other. And the fact that we have lots of different equivalences allows us to reason about the regular languages in lots of different ways. We can look at one perspective and see a whole bunch of properties that are really obvious, and then there'll be a bunch of things that aren't obvious about it at all. And then we look at the regular languages from another perspective, and we see a completely different set of things that are obvious, and a completely different set of things that aren't obvious at all. And so by switching our perspectives back and forth, we can learn lots of things about regular languages, and we can also learn lots of things about these different presentations of regular languages. So I want to start with the most basic one, finite state automata, uh, which are also called deterministic finite automata, or DFAs. The way that I like to think about these things is as just some sort of machine that has a keyboard on it and an indicator light. And you type in characters into the keyboard, you type in a word on the keyboard, um, and every time you hit a key, uh, it changes something internally in the system, right? The state of the system uh, updates, uh, the memory of the system updates uh, to reflect the fact that you hit the key, and that may or may not uh, turn on or off the indicator light. Uh, and so uh, your goal is to type in a word and then see uh, when you're done, is the indicator light on, in which case it's a good word, uh, or uh, if the indicator light is off, it's not a good word, according to the machine. So here we have, this is a very abstract drawing, we have our keyboard, which has a bunch of different characters on it from some finite collection of characters. And then we push the buttons in some order. Every time we push a button, the system changes. Uh, any time between when we're pushing the buttons, the system is not going to change. It, it doesn't have an internal clock or anything like that. It's not connected to any other external sources of data. It just sits there while it's waiting for me to press a new key. Uh, and then, uh, based on the internal state of the system, the indicator light will turn on or off. And the key thing, the finite in finite automata, is that there's only a finite amount of memory in this machine. So if I just key smash for a little bit, then eventually, by the pigeonhole principle, this machine will wind up in a state that it already was in before. In other words, it's going to completely forget everything that happened between the first time it wound up in that state and the next time it wound up in that state. Just completely forgets, goes back to the original state. And what this means is that these sorts of machines can't keep track of everything that we type into them, right? You could imagine wanting the machine to, like, know the entire word that I've typed in and then analyze it when I'm done typing it. But these machines can't work that way. It has to be the case that uh, they're processing the data as it comes in and they're throwing out some information because they only have a limited amount of memory. So data's coming in, they have a fixed amount of memory, they're gonna have to throw some data out uh, every time we send data in. Finite state automata are typically presented as very simple machines with a very small number of keys that we can uh, use to interface with the machine and a very small number of internal memory states. Finite state automata are meant to be an abstraction of systems where the amount of data coming in is much larger than the internal memory of the system. And this happens all the time nowadays, where you have computers that have these large data sets that are just streaming into them, and they can't store the entire data set. They have to decide what information they want to keep in order to do the calculations that they're trying to make, and then discard all the rest of the data. Uh, compare this versus Turing machines. Turing machines are an abstraction of computers whose memory is effectively infinite. That is, that the type of data that they're uh, interfacing with is much, much smaller in size than the actual memory of the computer. Of course, in our real world, we can't have a computer that has an infinite amount of memory in it. However, Turing machines are a really useful abstraction of computation. So, technically speaking, 
your computer, no matter how powerful it is, is actually much closer to a finite state automaton because it only has, think about how much memory it has, how many bits of memory it has. Each of those bits could either be a zero or a one, and so it has two to the power of the number of bits of memory that your computer has, possible states of its internal memory. And effectively this is infinite if we have small enough data sets that we're trying to process. But eventually, if you try to shove a large enough data set into your computer, it's going to start acting like a finite state automaton. It's going to have to start tossing stuff out. So there's kind of this duality between Turing machines where we have an infinite tape of memory, as much memory as we could possibly want, versus a finite state automaton, which we're very explicit about the fact that it has a finite amount of memory. So typically, if we want to reason about a finite state automaton, we really want to uh, be able to visualize all of its states and how those states are related to each other all at once. And this makes it really difficult to analyze your desktop computer as a finite state automaton because it has this ginormous number of states. We probably couldn't even fit a diagram for it uh, within the observable universe. So let's visualize the state diagram of a much simpler finite state automaton. So here I have a state diagram for a finite state automaton with three states. State 0, state 1, and state 2. And I've labeled a bunch of arrows with different characters, A, B, and C. So in this case, the set of possible inputs is just going to be three characters. We're going to have a keyboard that only has three letters on it, A, B, and C. And uh, what each arrow means is that when we're in this state, if we read this input, we wind up in this state. So if I'm in state 1 and I read the character C, I'm going to wind up in state 2. And of course, for each state, we can only have one arrow coming out of that state for each character, because we don't want to say, oh, well, if, if we're in state 1 and we read an A, do we go to 0 or do we go to 2? We don't want that sort of confusion. We want it to be well-defined in its behavior. That is, we want it to be deterministic. There's no uncertainty, there's no randomness in its behavior. So for each state, if we read in a particular input, we're going to wind up in a particular state in a well-defined way. And all of that information here is here on the diagram. There's also two extra pieces of information. There's an arrow coming in from the outside world pointing to state zero. What this means is that the finite state automaton starts off in state zero. Every time we want to check a different word on our machine, we turn the machine off, we reset its memory completely to its initial memory state, and then we start the machine back up. And when we start the machine up, in this case, for this machine, it's going to start in state zero. Your desktop computer can store memory between different sessions, but we don't want that for this type of machine because we want it to be well-defined. If I type a word in, every time I input a, the same word to this particular machine, I want it to give me the same answer, whether or not that word is good. And then the other piece of information that we have here are these double circles. I've double circled only one state, but you can double circle as many states as you want. And this is what's called the accept state. So it means that when the machine is in this state, the indicator light is on. It is happy with the word that I've typed in so far. So let's try running this machine. So we start off in state zero, and suppose that I type the letter B. Well, we're going to follow this arrow back to state zero. And then I'm going to type the letter A. That's going to take me from state zero into state one. At this point, if we stopped, if this was just the entirety of our input, this indicator light would be on, and that would mean that we accept the word. This word is a good word. It is part of our language. Uh, on the other hand, maybe we could keep going. We could type in B, A, and then we could type in another A. And now we're back in state zero, right? We do B, we do A, we do another A. We're back in state zero, so it's no good. The indicator light goes off. This word is not in our language. On the other hand, if we did something like B, A, A, B, 
A, we would again wind up back in state 1. And of course, if we saw a C at any time in our input, it would take us into state 2, and we would be trapped in state 2, and there's no way to make the light go on if you're trapped in state 2. So if we had a word like, I don't know, B, A, C, B, A, that would be no good, right? We go B, A, C, B, A. We'd wind up in state 2. We'd, we'd wind up in state 2 here, and we'd be stuck in state 2. And so we wouldn't reach state 1. We wouldn't reach an accept state by the end of the time that we've read this word. So this is not in the language. And so take a moment to think about what does this machine do? How do we determine if a word is in the language or not in the language? So what this machine does is it determines whether or not there are an odd number of A's in the word. It doesn't care how many B's. Notice that whenever we hit the character B, it doesn't change the state of the machine. <laughs> so it it only cares about the number of A's and the number of C's. And in particular, the number of A's has to be odd, has to get us to this one state and stay in the one state. So it can go back and forth an odd number of times. And it has to have no C's in it. So here, because we were able to find a finite state automaton that uh, accepted exactly this collection of words, that means that this collection of words forms a regular language. Here I'm using word in the mathematical sense. Mathematically, a word is just a string of symbols from some alphabet, and uh, an alphabet is just some finite set of characters. So these don't actually have to be words in the English language or any other language. They just have to be strings of characters. But we call them words anyway, and any collection, any set of words, is called a language. A language, such as this one, is called regular uh, exactly when it is defined by some sort of deterministic finite state automaton. Now, there's actually another way of keeping track of these finite state automata. These state diagrams are really useful visually, but if we wanted some more algorithmic-y sort of presentation for these finite state automata, we could do it in terms of what are called transition functions. So typically we use the letter lowercase delta to indicate our transition function, and this is going to be a function that takes in two inputs, the current state and the input character that we're inputting into the machine. So let's say that we're in state 1 and we type the character C into our machine. Well, that means that we're in state 1, we type the character C into the machine, we're going to wind up in state 2. So the output of the function on this input should be 2. And having this function here allows us to present our finite state automaton as a table, right? A table of what are the outputs if I input particular inputs into this machine. And sometimes that's more convenient to have than a graph. There's actually another presentation for transition functions that's actually a little bit more useful in some circumstances, and that is to have a particular transition function for every single state. So this is the transition function for the state C, so if we're in state 0 and we type the letter C, we're going to wind up in state 2. So this sort of presentation allows us to see our transitions as some sort of function from the set of states to the set of states. And then we have a separate function for each possible input, right? Uh, A will do, so uh, the function for C is always going to output 2. The function for a is going to swap 0 and 1. If we input a 0, it will output a 1. If we input a 1, it will output a 0. If we input a 2, it will leave it alone. And the function for b will is just the identity function. It will always output whatever we input. So we can either have a single function that defines everything, or we can have a set of functions for every input. And having these two different perspectives is sometimes very helpful. And so putting this all together, we very frequently define our finite state automata as a tuple of all of the information that characterizes that finite state automaton. So it starts off with uh, sigma. This is the alphabet. So in the case of this particular machine, 
The alphabet is the three letters A, B, and C. So this sigma is going to be the finite set just containing the symbols A, B, and C in it. Uh, the alphabet, we always want the alphabet to be finite. Uh, I guess you could consider cases where the alphabet is infinite, but let's not consider those cases uh, for the duration of this video series. Then we have a set of states. Again, we want this to be finite. And for this machine here, the set of states is 0, 1, and 2. Then we have a special state that is designated as the start state. In this case, the state 0. Next, we have our transition function. And finally, we have a set of accept states. These are the states that get double circled. These are the states that make the indicator light go on, that say, this is, was a word that you typed in that we are happy with. And the set of accept states can be any subset of the set of states. It doesn't have to be just one state. It can be as many states as you want. And so typically, when you're trying to present an automaton, you think about it in terms of this collection of information here. So we've already seen kind of two different perspectives for thinking about regular languages, for thinking about deterministic finite state automata. Uh, here, we see the perspective of thinking about them in terms of a collection of functions from a finite set to itself, right? The set of states to itself, and we have one function for each state. And so we have this collection of functions, and maybe we can think about finite state automata and regular languages in terms of those. We can also think about finite state automata in terms of paths through a graph. Here we have our graph, and every accepting word, every word that we accept in this machine is going to correspond to a path between zero, the start state, and one of our final states, in this case, just the state one. So we're talking about paths through this graph here, going from here to here. And so already we have two different perspectives for thinking about finite state automata, for thinking about regular languages. It can also be really useful to think of finite state automata as a particular type of computer program. Here I've modified a program from Kernighan and Ritchie to count the number of each digit within a program and to count the number of A's within the program. And it doesn't do anything with that data, but it, it could do stuff with that data. As we can see, this program is split up into three parts. We start off by declaring our variables, strictly defining exactly how much memory we're going to be using of the computer. Each of these data types, uh, integers, and then an array of integers, uh, has a limited number of possible configurations that it could be in. Uh, integers in the C programming language only go up to about 4.3 billion, which is useful for most practical purposes, but understand that this is a finite number. It means that if we input data that's much larger than 4.3 billion in size and the number of each digit, our digit counts are going to be off. And there's nothing we can do about that except possibly invoking malloc, the memory allocation function, which sounds a bit like a daemon and actually is a bit like a daemon in that if you summon it wrong, it can damage your computer. So we like to avoid using malloc. Then we initialize our variables. We set our memory into the start state of the automaton. And then we have a while loop, which reads in characters from the input. And as long as we haven't hit the EOF, the end of file, the end of the input, uh, we're going to modify the memory that we have in some given way. Uh, for this program, we update our digit counts, but any finite state automaton can be thought of as looking at the input character and modifying the memory in some way uh, based on that input character. And if this were genuinely a finite state automaton, it would look at the state of the memory at the end and either return a Boolean true or a Boolean false, yes or no, based on whether it was happy with the input that had been input into it. So it can be useful to think whenever you're writing a computer program, does your computer program fundamentally look like this? Is your computer program actually a finite state automaton? And if so, then you can analyze it using the tools that we use to analyze a finite state automata. So in the rest of this series of videos, I'd like to present to you lots more ways of thinking about regular languages leading up to how regular languages and finite state automata can tell us things about model theory. 
tell us things about the formulas that are true of particular structures. So that's it for this video, and I hope to see you in a future video.